I got friends only wanna talk business. I got expensive, cause when is expensive. I got expensive, cause when is expensive. I've been reading all the work. And I've been shutting down the stars. And welcome to Put That Coffee Down, the Frick Sells a Show for Closers. My name is Kevin Hill. I'm your host today, as always, here on Frick Waves TV, 12 p.m. Eastern Time, every Tuesday. We have a great show for you today. Have Omar Singh coming back on the show. He'll be on, on here in just a few minutes. We're going to talk about ecosystems or offering more services than your core service, kind of add-ons, uh, things that you can go in there uh, to your customers, to your clients, uh, drive value uh, about things that, uh, you know, again, aren't your core uh, core competencies maybe or core core services, I should say, and just uh, things that you've built in the background to, to operate more efficiently and providing value, leading with that value in the, in the sales process. But first, we're going to talk about uh, – well, recessions and down markets. We're in a freight recession right now in 2023. It's been going on for a while. Very challenging out there. Um, and then you have Silicon Valley Bank uh, last week. Is there more contagion ahead? Is there a recession? Economists are, are split about that. I think probably Anthony Smith probably has a split personality now. Yes, we're heading to a recession. No, we're not. He's, he's going to become like Sybil here in, in 2023. But with all that aside, I just wanted to, to share a few companies that were built and founded during the Great Recession back in 27, uh, 20, 2007, 2008, 2009, uh, some household names here. And I was talking to a couple of people over the week. And, you know, should you start out on your own? Should you not in a recession? And I think, especially when you're talking about freight and, and the up and down cyclical nature of the freight game, it makes sense. You know, a lot of people will tell you not to go out and start something during a down market. But you know what? That, that's, that's, it's, it's good to go against the grain sometimes. Um, because if you start in the down market, you're going to build the infrastructure uh, both operationally as well as in your sales and marketing game. You might not get a lot of yeses. You're going to get turned down a lot. But you know what? You're going to talk to a lot of people. You're going to make your name known. You're going to build whatever brand equity you can in that down market. And as soon as that market turns, it heats up again. You can capitalize on all that hard work that you did during the down market, right? You're not a non quantity. You're not someone just coming out of the, the wilderness and, and approaching people when the market is hot. Uh, you have some sense of a track record, even if it's just in conversation alone or a lost deals alone. Uh, you've been evaluated. You've kind of been vetted by your customers. And it helps you take advantage of that down market uh, or that up market because you put in all the work in the down market. So I think that is uh, so something to keep in mind as we, we go through this uh, down market and rates, down markets or up market and capacity, you, you could say. Is is this is the time to, to really grind it out because then you become a known quantity. You've already been vetted. You've already been introduced to your your future client base that's telling you no today. It, it very well could be yes tomorrow if you're doing everything right by building that foundation. So let's talk about some a famous company started in the Great Recession, roughly 2008, 2010. Uh, it lasted forever. It seemed like. Uh, but number one is is Nerd Wallet on the list, not number one in market size. But Nerd Wallet it was founded in twenty nineteen or two thousand nine uh, by Tim Chen after he lost his hedge fund job during the holiday season of two thousand eight. And then the next one on the list, everyone knows Uber. Uber is all around fifty billion dollar company, uh, and it all started with trying to find out how to split the, the bill when they hired a private driver for a New Year's Eve party. Uh, they got frustrated with it, started building an app, and now we have Uber today. The next one is Groupon. It started out as a community for furthering collective goals. And then when the recession hit, everyone went broke, and everyone just wanted a good deals and a lot of them. So Groupon is a famous company that haven't been doing very well over the last few years. Um, they've had some, some issues themselves, but 
everyone knows who Groupon is. And then you have Venmo, right? So, so Venmo, someone left his wallet at home, couldn't pay his friend, and voila, Venmo comes along and it takes away about 90% of all excuses why you can't pay your friends back today because all you have to do is open up your phone and pay them. You can't say, I lost my wallet or I don't have my cash on me. Um, back before ATM cards, that was an easy thing to do. Your friend's looking for, for money. And uh, if you didn't have cash, you didn't have cash. And that was the end of the story. But now with payments on, on cell phones, it makes a lot of things a lot easier. But then everyone knows that you have money on you, which is sometimes not, not a good thing. So then the, the final one here on my list is WhatsApp. Because we all need one more messaging app in our lives. To be fair, in 20, 2008, we probably did need one more messaging app in our lives. 2023, I don't know if we need another uh, messaging app to, to keep track of in, in our lives. But WhatsApp started in in 2008 uh, during the, the Great Recession. So I was looking for a Great Depression as well, and it, it got a little murky because there's some famous companies on there, but they, they haven't been around in a while because they were acquired or sometimes they went bankrupt. But, you know, a, a lot of companies made uh, their, their mark during the, the, the Great Depression. And so, so it is, you know, it's counterintuitive, but a lot of times in business and in sales as well, you have to go against the grain and be counterintuitive. And someone who is really great at that, one of my favorite people in the freight industry and the sharpest dressed one as well, is going to join me right now. It's Omar Singh. He is the founder and president of Surge Transportation. Welcome to the show, Omar. Hey, Kevin. Great to be here again. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> You bet. Anytime. Anytime. We're going to talk about ecosystems and things, but let's talk about what's been going on in your world, uh, you know, in the market, kind of what you're seeing out there. You've been a manifest. You're food shippers, right? You're, you're at every show um, all across the country. Um, what, what's the, the sentiment out there right now? You know, I, I think if, when I listen to some of the economists, they say that it's going to get worse. But when I talk to some of, you know, the financial technology companies and supply chain, our own customer base, our, our own load count, and most people are saying it, it looks like we hit bottom about six weeks ago. And I hope that's true. And I'm not saying it's going to be a rapid climb out of it, but you know, all of the data that we have in our own company and from other people who have a lot more data than we have are saying it looks like the industry kind of hit bottom. And I just really hope that's true for everybody. You know, um, I do too. You know, I mean, the, the, the economists are saying 2023 recession. I think we went kind of went through it in 2022, or at least I was convinced about it. You know, I was making calls about a year ago uh, or a little over a year ago talking about a recession. Anthony Smith and I were, were, were on freight waves now doing that. And it seems like it's, it's, to, to me, it seems like it's getting a little better myself as well. You know, I, I think that, you know, the, the second, third, fourth quarters of, of last year uh, were, were much more uns much more uncertainty about that than what we have in the market right now. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, f for us on our side, I mean, we, we rely on supply as much as demand. So if even even if demand changes, if we have some supply leaving the market, you know, then then we feel that. But of course, if consumer confidence isn't there and there isn't demand, you know, so I don't know if demand has changed, but maybe, you know, we hear about, unfortunately, companies closing down. So maybe some supply is leaving the market and that's what people are feeling. Um, but it's both sides for us, right? It's always that imbalance between mm -hmm. supply and demand, which can make for a good year or a bad year, really. Yeah, I mean, 2019 was a good lesson on that as well because the economy was, you know, it wasn't doing quite as well. You know, it wasn't as quite as strong as 2018, but it was still a really good economy in, in 2019. But the, the capacity out there, truck capacity especially, um, really knocked down and, and made it just a, a really, you know, blah market for for about uh, well until the pandemic hit. Yeah, I agree. But I appreciate, though, that was the down year, right, that you introduced this show mm -hmm. talking about kind of selling in a down market and how you do that. Um, when we went independent at the end of 16, kind of 
I had a, a Q4 contract with my largest leg, legacy customer that carried us into 2017 and 18. And so I didn't really sell it in down market, but I didn't diversify the customer base either. And we really started reaching out and doing a lot of marketing and, and new customer sales in 18 and 19. And, and you're right, we didn't have as much mm-hmm. competition getting out in front of customers. There was you know, many people beating on the door for meetings but all of them kind of said, wait for things to turn around. Yeah, I've taken the time. I heard what you have to say. I like everything that I see, but there's just no reason for me to bring anyone on right now. And then, of course, the way 2020 hit, you know, kind of 100 people call in March of 2020 and say, remember that meeting we had a year ago? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, exactly so, right. And I, I think um, I, I think a lot of salespeople and a lot of business owners as well, you know, I mean, they, they, they go, they, they walk in. I, I think we're all enthralled with that one call close. Right, I'm going to walk right. in. I'm going to woo them. I'm going to knock their socks off and I'm going to walk out with money. And, uh, and it doesn't really work that way. It takes takes a right. while, right? And as you said, the, the timing has to be right. But you have to be in front of them constantly before the timing is right because that's who's going to get the, the business when the timing is right. It's, it's people that they know, the people that they've been talking to, not new entrants uh, showing up on the doorstep saying, I can fix all your problems. Yeah, for the very first time, right? It's nice to meet you. Yep. I know, I know on yeah. the conference circuit, yeah. you know, we do a lot of conferences in person and a lot of people say that it takes three years for really the community to begin to feel comfortable with you, you know, speaking, yeah. of course, having yeah. booths and just meeting everybody, but they say, yeah, it takes three years. So I agree I would, with that. You know, I started, yeah, I started in 2017 at TIA and 2018 at Freightway. was uh, going to, to conferences. And, you know, that first year, it's all a whirlwind. You know, you're meeting people. You're, you're going up and being the used car salesman in, in some ways. And then, then the next conference you go to, you, know, you meet the people that you met at the first one or you see them, right, and you start developing those friendships and, and relationships. And it takes about three years before um, – you're, you're, you yourself is, is a really, a, you, you are a known quantity, right? You're yeah. familiar face. And then you it walk in, time. you know everybody in the room. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's talk about ecosystems. I, I know you want to talk about, e- uh, about ecosystems, and it really goes into offering value above moving a truck, right? Your, your core thing that you do in your business and that is, you know, there's different methods for that. You've built um, the, the, the integrations and tech uh, in search transportation allows your customers to, to to see things, to have visibility beyond that link in the supply chain. And I'll let you explain it yourself because you can probably do it better than I can. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's what we're learning now is just so many people are developing either their own products and capabilities to make their own companies more efficient, but also, you know, to help their customers maybe understand what's going on in their network that, I mean, of course, core business model for us and brokerage is, you know, matching shippers and motor carriers, um, you know, and arranging for the transportation of, of their goods. But in order to really differentiate ourselves among the sea of more than 30,000 brokers, I think for us kind of layer one was developing the real time pricing capability. So it's faster, it's more accurate, it's more efficient, it's 24 seven. But, but now I think we're even getting beyond that to a certain extent where they're competing companies that are either offering that as a third party platform or just more companies developing the capability. So now it's, kind of becoming about more about, you know, who else are we integrated with so we can bring our ecosystem to you and have the overall partnership experience, customer experience, just be that much better to make it make sense for you to work with us. So, you know, it's everything from partnering with weather visibility, you know, companies. So we know ahead of time what's going on with just weather events around the country visibility partners, all of the visibility platforms to make sure we can accommodate our customers, you know, banks and payment portals to streamline, you know, anything for motor carriers and already be integrated, you know, with our own customers and just sort of every single relationship 
that we can deliver to them to make the whole experience be, you know, just more valuable, I think is, you know, vis visiting FreightWaves F3 is a case in point. You know, I always just get amazed how many partners we have in the room at one given time. I think it's 17, it's up to 20 now um, that are all part of what help us do what we do. And a lot of the, you know, driving value, right, you're remo removing friction from the process. And I think that's what all customers want. And they, they want to, to remove friction and also have the, 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 the data and talking about weather analytics uh, as well and providing that because it kind of went, you know, the evolution is you, you move shipment, you arrange transportation from point A to point B. Then we want to see it on the map. Then we want kind of... Uh, you know, automated backroom processes, you know, or, or back office, uh, you know, payment processing, you know, paperwork. And then um, besides the blue dot on the map on visibility, we, we kind of want to, to know um, some metrics behind that, um, some kind of forward predictions uh, about when, when our freight might show up. And having all that, that removes a lot of friction and it does drive value. Yeah, I think one of the big things for us right now has been weather as well, because it's, you know, we, I always say we used to do a good job of looking at the origin city and the destination city, but we didn't really do a good job of looking at the route. Um, and if, if you, you know, if, if you're going to have a storm in Colorado and the highway is going to be shut down, you know, between your pickup and your delivery, you know, that's going to matter just as much, if not more, as what's happening in either of those origin cities. Um, and so you can route around it. You can explain routing around it. You can explain potentially out of route miles or just delays ahead of time, or maybe even hopefully collaboratively say it might not be good to ship this today because you know, you're going to get there. So we might as well ship it, you know, with just tighten the transit a little bit. So, you know, your drinks don't freeze in transit because we're stuck on the highway for two days and it's 10 degrees outside. Um, because you want to keep it moving, but it, it it's really been a big thing recently to to learn how to get better at looking at the whole route and what are the routing options from the beginning, rather than just after we kind of get stuck. Yeah, it goes from um, identifying the the issue when it happens, right, to being able to to have those conversations with probabilities of this may be happening. These are our options. This is my. This is what I would recommend, which gets you from just being the, the sales salesperson to more of a consultant, which uh, you know we all want to be, right? We want to, to be the, the experts, the consultants to our customers, instead of uh, the, the salesperson just doing a transaction. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably the holy grail of the partnerships, right? You want your customers mm -hmm. to reach out to you and say. Hey, what do you think I should do here? I value your opinion or I know your data is good. I know you're looking at this. Right. And so that's, I think, where that ecosystem comes in, where it's not just a rate and hopefully a truck and no communication or, you know, consultation. What do you think we should do this week or out of this origin? I mean, sometimes we even need to source product from different origins because, you know, one is affected by weather and the other isn't. So, um, those are really important relationships and conversations to have. Yeah, and developing the ecosystem, having those integrations, uh, you, you get to leverage, you know, all these great organizations out there working in their niche, doing their specialization. You get to leverage all that information to convey to your customer, uh, which just it just drives immense value above and beyond moving uh, a truck from point A to, to point B, and it lets you. Um, it lets you, you know, you get into the, you know, call it premium pricing or defending your pricing or uh, for, for your service and, and be able to, to leverage off of all these different tech and data companies and provide that in, in your solution, in your expertise, in your opinion uh, to your customer. It's just uh, it's what what has to happen, right? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think what I've. The way I look at it now is that we are fundamentally, you know, core business model, certainly brokerage, but really have to have true 
tech partners out there as well that can help you, you know, sort of do more than that. And so, again, like our original tech partners are TMSs and pricing, but now it's, you know, kind of who else can make us better? Who else can help our customers remove friction? You know, who else can we be integrated with? And I think what I'm seeing, what we're seeing in the, in just the pure tech, you know, financial technology, um, freight technology is that they're partnering with each other. Even competitors are partnering with each other to, to find better ways of just being more relevant to everybody by being so entrenched in so many TMSs and so many shipper TMSs and motor carrier TMSs and so many different companies and so many integrations that you almost have to work with each other at some point. Um, so it's, it's exciting for me to watch that and to kind of realize we have to be doing a lot of the same with, you know, whatever our, our tech play is outside of the core business model of moving freight. Yeah, because if you're going to scale a brokerage these days, you have to have, yeah, well, you have to have tech, you have to have those integrations and you have to be serious about it, which, which you are. You've been, you've been doing the conference circuit, as we, we mentioned earlier, uh, any highlights, anything, um, interesting out there that, that the market is talking about right now? Well, I hope everybody's right about, you know, hitting, hitting the bottom six weeks ago. Um, I'm excited. There was a press release that came out in the fall that we have a, you know, kind of carrier highlight partnership with E2 open. They'll be displaying our rates for customers. And we're hoping that kind of really helps us through this year. Last year was tough. So, um, you know, getting the load count back to where it was would be nice. I think everybody's down revenue per load and number of loads. But um, so we're excited about that. Um, and we're excited about projecting the bottom, you know, being over. But, yeah, we have a lot of things coming up. We have a Barcelona conference in a few weeks. And then, of course, TIA, which is more of a partnership conference for us than, than, you know, a vendor partnership conference and technology conference than it is, you know, a customer event. But, um, you know, sort of always being out on both sides, hoping to maybe visit some motor carrier conferences this year and uh, do a little bit more strategic um, partnering with carriers and, you know, a just a more present way, sort of like how we go to shipper conferences is really starting to go to motor, motor yeah. carrier conferences as well. So we want to add that. Do you think that's the, um, the next step in the evolution is integrating with more carrier partners uh, than the most brokerages do today? Do you think that is uh, that that's a frontier out there that's relatively untapped? I think it's necessary, you know, and I think it's sort of the holy grail of brokerage when people – Brokers can get business and then sort of strategically place it or work on it with just a couple of motor carriers, if not one. Um, personally, from Surge's transportation model, since we have something of a business continuity backup overflow model where I call it strategic transactional, um, we don't have as many of the high volume lanes as you might think as being able just to kind of cover the freight that primaries aren't able to get to for one reason yeah. or another. Um, and so that sometimes makes strategic motor carrier partnerships more challenging because we can't go to them and always and say, I have 150 loads a year from Jacksonville to Chicago. Right. And so that's, it's been challenging and I want to make an effort to really get out there and sit down and we've already been meeting with some, you know, kind of 50, 80 truck fleets to sit down and say, you know, where can we really develop a true, partnership and visit the yards and, you know, mm -hmm. um, be a lot more strategic and, um, proactive about it. So I'm hoping that yields great results, uh, this year. I think that it will every time we meet with carriers on site, I mean, it's, it's a great experience for them and for us. So, um, yeah, I hope that brings a lot of value to our customers as well. I think it will. I think that is an untapped frontier. I think carriers, uh, you know, very stereotypically, I suppose, have been behind on the, the tech curve the, than everybody else. I think they're catching up. And as they do, I think integrating whenever you can with smaller players, you know, 50 trucks, 20 trucks, 10 trucks uh, makes a lot of sense. And I, I think it would drive a lot of value. Um, Omar, 
thanks so much for uh, joining us today on Put That Coffee Down. It's always a pleasure. And, um, you know, I'll see you at at TIA in in person here in uh, about a month or so. See you next month. Yeah, great to be here. Yeah, you bet. And thank you. And uh, we have a few I Put That Coffee Downs uh, audio-only podcasts out. David Hoffeld, I recorded uh, not too long ago. Uh, it, was a, it was a great listen. Jason Rabin, I sat down with him, talked about apparel companies and freight brokerages. And also uh, Paul Estrada um, sat down. He's an enterprise shipper. Uh, that will be coming out later this week. But with all of that said, thank you for joining us today on Put That Coffee Down. You can download podcasts wherever you download your podcast and watch us here on YouTube or Freight Waves TV. Till next week. I got friends only want to talk business. I got expenses, cause wind is expensive. I got expenses, cause wind is expensive. I've been reading all the work. And I've been shutting down the stars.